we're going to talk about Fourier multipliers for a little while. Fourier multipliers. And I guess Fourier analysis isn't formally a prerequisite for the course. Like I'm not going to assume people know a lot about Fourier analysis, but it's sort of hard to talk about Fourier multipliers without a little bit of that intuition. So I'm, I'm hoping I can at least give you a little bit of that intuition if you don't already have it. And if you do, then, then you'll be fine. You would have seen this sort of stuff before. So let's just make some recollections of what the Fourier transform is. And I'll define what Fourier multipliers are. So let's just take X to be a complex Banach space. At least the way that I'm doing things, X has to be complex because we're gonna multiply vectors by complex exponentials. And these are complex numbers. So kind of hard to do that when you have a real Banach space. And let's take a function F that's L1 valued in X on the real line. All of this also works for RD instead of just R1, but I'm just gonna focus on R1. The Fourier transform of F, which you call F hat, of a frequency psi, we might also write this as curly F of F, is defined like this. If I haven't made any mistakes, this is the usual definition of the Fourier transform, but we're taking a Bochner integral instead of a Lebesgue integral. This is for all frequencies psi in R. This is what I refer to as a complex exponential function. I know I've mentioned this in the class before, so technically you have all seen this before. This is just a reminder. We also have the inverse Fourier transform that we write like this. And it's basically the same definition, but we have a plus instead of a minus here. And I'm gonna write this as F, F check, technically this is F check of T rather than of Xi to emphasize that like t is a time variable, xi is a frequency variable. And we'll write it like that for all t in r. And when you define things like this, you will have that the Fourier transform of f and the inverse Fourier transform of f are both continuous, continuous and bounded. So I'll write c r x as a the set of bounded continuous functions on the real line. So this is contained in L infinity. This is of course assuming F is integrable so that everything actually makes sense. And furthermore, if, so I'm already assuming F is in L1, but if in addition to that, the Fourier transform of F is also in L1, which doesn't always happen, then we have a Fourier inversion formula which says that F is F hat check Fourier transform inverse Fourier transform or the other way around. If you wanna write it like that, take the inverse and the, I think this works. I think this makes sense. Maybe this is true up to a reflection. It's possible that I've missed a reflection somewhere. This is probably correct. So what this means is that F of T is almost everywhere equal to this Fourier transform here, or this inverse Fourier transform. So this is a Fourier representation of F almost everywhere because these are this is true as elements of L1. Let me just quickly, I forgot to make Mark a co-host and he's supposed to be recording. One minute. Marco, you can now record. Very good. We cut this bit out on YouTube. Okay. So yes, this is a Fourier representation of F. It says that F can be written as a superposition of complex exponentials. Superposition of complex exponentials. Remember that the, the real part and the complex part of this complex exponential are trigonometric functions, sines and cosines. So this is the way of writing F out in terms of waves. I assume you've all seen the Fourier transform before, so I'm explaining to you something that you already know. But this is now for X valued functions. All of the formulas are the same, but everything is now Bochner integrals, right? 
these Fourier coefficients are, are vectors. So you still have the vector valued functions uh, superpositions of complex exponentials, but now the coefficients are vectors. That's all that changes. Everything there's the same as always. Now, Fourier multipliers are operators that take this representation of F here, this Fourier representation, and then multiply the coefficients by some scalars, M of Xi. So for every frequency, you have a multiplier that multiplies that frequency component by this number. And classically, these coefficients, these M of Xi, classically, these are scalars. When you're looking at scalar valued functions, of course, you have scalar coefficients. You multiply it by a scalar, that makes sense. But now we're dealing with vector valued functions and you don't, you can of course multiply them by scalars, but you can also apply operators to them and you can get operator valued Fourier multipliers like this. I'm gonna define this formally. Let's make our definition. Let's take X, let's write it in a different color. Let's take X and Y. So we have two Banach spaces lying around two complex Banach spaces. And let's take a function, a capital M, which is going to be a bounded function on R and it's taking values in the bounded linear operators from X to Y. So it's bounded, it's strongly measurable because I've written it as an element of a Bochner space. You can relax this strong measurability assumption a, a little bit, but it doesn't matter. It's an operator valued function. Of course, it is a vector valued function. This space of operators is a Banach space, but it's an operator valued function. It has a bit more structure than purely being Banach valued. So with this information, the Fourier multiplier which I will write as T sub M I'm going to define it as an operator from compactly supported smooth functions valued in X into continuous functions valued in Y, although this is just a fairly arbitrary choice as where to define it. It's defined by taking the Fourier transform of F, multiplying that function pointwise by M. Of course, by multiplying pointwise, I mean pointwise applying the operators M of Xi to the values and then taking the inverse Fourier transform of the result. And a, a better way to look at that is to say that Tm of f of t is almost everywhere equal to this Fourier integral. So this representation we had before, but now we apply m of xi to all of these coefficients. So now these, these coefficients are in X. This is an operator from X to Y. So these are now Y valued coefficients and coefficients in Y. All right. Uh, also the function M is called the symbol. This is important terminology. It's called the symbol of the operator T sub M. In case you haven't heard that symbol terminology before, some people haven't, but this is common terminology. Right, that's what a Fourier multiplier is. In particular, that's what an, an operator valued Fourier multiplier is on vector valued functions. The fact that the, the symbol is operator valued adds quite a bit of complexity over the scalar valued situation where you purely just have scalar valued symbols and you multiply them, multiply the coefficients by the values of the symbol. Is that relatively clear to everybody how this definition works? Anyone got any issues? I guess the big question is why do I define it on these spaces? Why have I defined it on compactly supported smooth functions? Purely because it's well-defined here. This isn't the only choice, as I said, but this is a, a nice straightforward choice. I'm gonna show that this thing's well-defined because I haven't proven that this thing's actually well-defined. I've just given you a definition. This is fairly standard Fourier analytic arguments, but I'll do it anyway, just for the practice. If F is compactly supported and smooth and M is bounded, I'll say L infinity 
and operator valued, then what we need in order for this thing to be well defined is we need that f hat is in L1 and m applied to f hat is also in L1 but valued in Y. This second property means that I can take the inverse Fourier transform of that thing and yeah, actually I don't, yeah. All I really need is this, basically. I'm using that if F is compactly supported and smooth, then it's integral. So that the Fourier transform of F is already defined. That's, I don't need to prove anything there. That's automatically true. The difficulty is showing, well, not really difficulty, but the only non-trivial thing is that showing that the Fourier transform of F is also in L1. All you know a priori is that it's bounded and continuous. So let's prove this mostly. So let's just look at the second part first. This follows from the first part. Uh, except we have to show some strong measurability. It's easy enough to show that this function m of f hat is bounded, showing that it's strongly measurable. You just have to do an argument with either simple functions or the Petter's theorem. And I'm going to skip that proof because it's boring. Um, but you can do that proof in your head if you like. If you're good enough with simple functions, it's, it's easy enough. I mean, approximate m by simple functions, approximate f hat by simple functions, do the multiples, do the multiplication, it'll work or use petters in the right way. Uh, the boundedness is just, if I take M and apply it to F hat, and I'll take its L1 norm, that's bounded by the L infinity norm of M times the L1 norm of F hat. So of course, if F hat's in L1, M is in, M is in L infinity by assumption, so this thing is in L1. That's not a problem. That's all very easy. What we need to show is that f hat is integrable. So this is, as I said, a standard free argument and we'll just do it for the practice. This is what we want to integrate. And how do we control this? We control this by a part near the origin and a part at infinity or at least away from the origin. We want to exploit that actually the Fourier transform of F has some decay away from the origin. And this comes from the fact that F has some differentiability. Actually, F is smooth by assumption and compactly supported. And that's actually gonna be enough if you know Fourier analysis to give you quite a lot of decay of the Fourier transform away from the origin. So at least this part at the origin, this isn't a problem because this is less than two times the L infinity norm of F hat, which of course is less than two times the L1 norm of F and F is smooth and compactly supported. So it's integrable. So this is finite, that's not a problem. We don't need to use any decay near the origin. Now for this part, away from the origin. What do we need to do here? We use this property that multiplying the Fourier transform by a polynomial corresponds to taking the Fourier transform of derivatives. And we're gonna use that to pull out some polynomial decay of this function. So let's just cleverly write minus i x i squared on minus i x i squared, just out of nowhere, applied to f hat of x i. We write that because then we can take out this modulus of x i to the minus two. We get a decay factor that comes from the denominator here. And what we have left is minus i x i squared of the Fourier transform of F. And if you know Fourier analysis, you recognize that as 
the second derivative of f Fourier transform. If you haven't seen that before, um, study the notes a bit, revise a bit of Fourier analysis. It's not too important. Oh, yeah, okay, it's important, but whatever. So now we use this decay. We say, okay, this is less than two times the integral from one to infinity of psi to the minus two d psi. This integral converges. Everything's finite here because you have a quadratic decay times the L infinity norm of the Fourier transform of the second derivative of F. This thing's finite. This thing is obviously controlled by the L1 norm of the second derivative of F. And that's also finite because F smooth and compactly supported. No issues at all there. That's the whole proof. This is a pretty standard technique in Fourier analysis, trading off differentiability of a function for decay of its Fourier transform like this. I don't think we're going to explicitly use it anymore. I just thought I'd better show you this at least once. All of these arguments work equally well for vector valued functions as they do for scalar valued functions, of course. It's exactly the same argument. Nothing changes really. This little identity here, I should write that more explicitly. Minus i xi f hat of xi equals the Fourier, yeah, Fourier transform of derivative of f at xi. This is true for scalar valued functions. You can just prove it by looking at the integral and doing the derivatives. Um, yeah, showing this effect of valued functions just follows in exactly the same way. Or you can test against functionals and deduce it from the scalar result, if you like, this scalarization procedure we've done a couple of times. Does anyone have any questions about it? That's not confusing to anybody. Alex? Yeah. Uh, so like, I knew a version of this Fourier inversion and stuff for the real valued case. And there, I mean, the assumptions were too little. I mean, they just assumed, I think it was C1 and it like FX is big O of mod X power one minus epsilon. For Other, each epsilon um, the than Fourier zero. inversion, you mean, you said? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, regarding I mean, Fourier analysis kind of stuff. I've stated this for, what have I said? If F is L1 and F hat is L1, I think here. Yeah. Uh, Oops, I don't want to cross it out. I want to highlight it. At least when you're dealing with the Fourier transform as, as defined on L1 functions, I think this is minimal. Like you, if you want it to be defined on, maybe if you talk about just distributions, you can get away with less. Yeah, maybe like there is a trade-off. Like if you have, if you allow F to have some more assumptions, then maybe you can like remove some of the hypothesis from the theorem of proposition. Makes sense. I mean, I'm not claiming these are minimal assumptions. This is just, this will work. This isn't necessarily the best statement, but it'll, it'll work for us. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You, you can say a lot more about Fourier transforms than what I'm gonna say, of course, particularly if you define them on distributions instead of just on functions, then you can do a whole lot more, but I wanna avoid distributions if I can. So. Okay, yeah. At least that Thanks. level of generality. But yeah, you can say a lot more than what I've said here. Okay, so what have I done? I've defined Fourier multipliers on compactly supported smooth functions. Everything's well defined. They map compactly supported smooth to continuous. And we want to define them on LP. That's the question for us. As harmonic analysts, we want to define everything on LP. That's all, basically all we do. So let's just note that down. This is well defined. And we have that the compactly supported smooth functions are densely contained in LP. As long as P is between one and infinity. One's included, infinity's not. So when can we extend these Fourier multipliers to operators on LP? That's our question. Quantitatively, what we want to know When do we have the estimate LP norm of the Fourier multiplier applied to F is controlled by LP norm of F. Of course, F is X valued. The operator is Y valued. So we're mapping LP X into LP Y. 
when do we have this for all compactly supported smooth F? Once we have this, if we have this, this would let us define our Fourier multiplier with symbol M as an operator from LP valued in X into LP valued in Y, just by density and continuity as you usually do. <coughs> so obviously the answer is gonna depend on M because not all M are going to work. And it's also going to depend on X and Y because not all Banach spaces are gonna work either. That's what you expect at this point. So an example that we've already seen is the Hilbert transform. So let's consider that as a, a bounded operator on scalar valued functions. P is greater than one less than infinity. Now we didn't define this as a Fourier multiplier. We defined this as an integral operator as a singular integral operator with this kernel one on Y with this limiting procedure that makes sense of that. <coughs> Actually, it turns out this is a Fourier multiplier as well. So we have that H is the Fourier multiplier with symbol M, scalar valued symbol. The symbol is given by minus I times the sine of Xi or the signum function as it's usually called for some reason. So this is either minus i or i, depending on whether xi is greater than zero or less than zero. And we don't define the symbol at zero because you only need to define it as an element of L infinity. So it only needs to be defined almost everywhere. You can forget a point, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the result. Uh, I'm not gonna prove that the Hilbert transform has this representation because this is standard in harmonic analysis and I'm assuming that it's known. Uh, you can pick up any harmonic analysis textbook and see the proof. It's just a computation of the, the Fourier transform of this one on Y kernel. It all works out in the end. We don't need to prove that. Uh, the Barnack valued version, so the X valued version, uh, when the X is UMD, is still a Fourier multiplier. <laughs> That's sort of a tautology. I mean, it's a, if you take a, a scalar valued Fourier multiplier and you look at its X valued extension, that's still a Fourier multiplier, except now you're using the X valued Fourier transform. Uh, it has the same symbol, of course, but if you want to think of a, I've said that the symbol of a Fourier multiplier and vector valued functions is operator valued, right? And scalars are not operators. Of course, you can see the scalar field as sitting inside the linear operators from any Barnack space to itself, where a scalar acts on a vector by scalar multiplication. This is all very trivial, <laughs> all very simple. Just a little side note here, whenever you have a uh, a scalar valued symbol for a Fourier multiplier, you can define an operator valued Fourier multiplier on any Barnard space you like, simply because this holds for all Barnard spaces X, right? I think this is getting too technical. Maybe I should move on from that point. So we know at least for the Hilbert transform for this particular symbol, you know that this Fourier multiplier is bounded on X valued LP spaces provided P's between one and infinity and provided the Barnack space is UMD. It turns out this statement's if and only if, we haven't proven that yet. So you see from the Hilbert transform that the UMD property comes in to Fourier multiplier theorems. You kind of only expect nice Fourier multiplier theorems when the Barnack spaces are UMD. And this is true. So what's a Fourier multiplier theorem? I've talked about Fourier multipliers. What's a Fourier multiplier theorem? So the point of a Fourier multiplier theorem is to take a particular class of symbols with some smoothness or boundedness assumptions and say, okay, all symbols in this class lead to bounded operators on LP for some range of P. Maybe P is just two. Maybe you can take all P between one and infinity. Maybe you have a restricted range of P. 
Uh, there are a whole lot of Fourier multiplier theorems out there. It's a whole sort of subfield of harmonic analysis. I'm just going to talk about one of them, which is the Mifflin theorem. Uh, just on scalar valued functions for now. I think Michlin was might have been the guy that sort of, I don't think he invented Fourier multipliers, but apparently he invented the concept of a symbol. So I would say that's a fair bit of claim to having invented Fourier multipliers. Also, there's more than one transliteration of this name. So I don't know if this is, this is the Wikipedia transliteration. There are others. Sometimes the K is dropped. Obviously, it's not an English name. Here's the theorem. This is one form of the theorem. There are plenty of forms of this theorem. Here's just one. Suppose the symbol M, scalar valued. Suppose it's differentiable. And we need that the supremum, actually, I'm not even going to define it on all of R. Let's say M is defined on the real line minus the origin, just like the symbol of the Hilbert transform, which we didn't define at the origin. And let's say the supremum over all psi in that domain of m plus psi m prime psi. So this m prime is the derivative of m. Let's suppose this supremum is finite. This says that m is bounded and the derivative of m has some decay away from the origin because as you take psi m prime as psi gets large, if you want this thing to be bounded, m prime has to decay but you have less and less control as you approach the origin. The origin is essentially allowed to be a singularity. The differentiability is allowed to break down at the origin exactly as it does for the symbol of the Hilbert transform, which is nice and differentiable, except at the origin where you've got nothing. Okay, you've got some control at the origin. It's got a jump discontinuity. That's not so bad. But yeah. Suppose you have these assumptions on M, then the Fourier multiplier with symbol M is bounded on LP. Uh, for all p greater than one, less than infinity. This is, I guess, the, the prototypical Fourier multiplier theorem. It gives you estimates on all LP in the reflexive range using boundedness and smoothness or differentiability assumptions on the symbol in a quantitative form. As I said, there are many forms of the Michelin theorem. We're actually going to prove a slightly different form of the theorem for operator valued symbols. But this is, I guess, the, the simplest form for, for describing what these theorems generally look like. Yeah, maybe I can make a comment. I don't, did you say that, uh, I mean, this condition here is scaling invariant, right? Yeah, so I'm going to use this too. This is a scale invariant condition. Okay. This factor in front of the derivative means that if you take M and you, you take an L infinity normalized dilation. So if you replace M, let me write, if you replace M of Xi with M of Xi, on lambda for some lambda positive. So you scale the thing out. This, this norm, which I'd call a Michelin norm of the symbol doesn't change. That's just how the differentiation works when you do rescalings. So yeah, there's, this is important. Like there's some scale invariance of Fourier multipliers and this condition is also scale invariant. So that makes sense. You see this very clearly with the Hilbert transform as well, that the symbol of this thing is scale invariant is dilation invariant completely. This is the dilation invariance of the Hilbert transform, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yes. So we're going to do an operator valued version of this theorem acting on UMD Barnack spaces. So we're going to have this kind of boundedness and smoothness condition on the symbol. That's not going to change. That's necessary. I mean, we're going to prove something that implies the scalar valued Michelin theorem. So naturally we're going to need that assumption. But we're also going to need, interestingly, we also need operator theoretic assumptions. Operator theoretic assumptions on operator valued symbols. At least when you consider scalar valued symbols on vector valued functions, this Michelin theorem still holds as long as the Barnack space is a UMD. The, the condition on the symbol is exactly the same. The condition on the Barnack spaces is UMD. 
but we're going to do the full generality of operator valued symbols and then you start to actually have operator theoretic conditions as well as well as just barnack valued barnack space conditions i'm going to define them now I say operator theoretic assumptions. What I should say is an operator theoretic assumption. There's only really one concept we need here. Let's take some Barnack spaces X and Y. They don't need to be complex. This is just a Barnack space thing. And let's take a set of operators, script T. I can't draw script T's very well. Script T, subset of bounded linear operators from X to Y. Uh, the sort of set you should imagine is the the range of a symbol is going to be a, a set of operators. You can look at the elements, the you can look at the symbol M of Xi for every Xi, you get an operator for each Xi, you look at the set over all Xi. We're going to have conditions on that set. We say that the set T is R bounded. If there exists a constant C, which is finite, such that, okay, let's quantify, such that for all finite sequences of operators Tn in the set, for all finite sequences of vectors Xn in X, we have the estimate I'm going to write it in two ways. Firstly, using Rademacher spaces. Secondly, directly using Rademacher averages. The shortest possible way of writing this condition is this. This is extremely compact notation <laughs> for Rademacher spaces. Uh, I'll write what that means more precisely if you've forgotten how the Rademacher spaces work. You take a Rademacher average of Tn applied to Xn. Uh, the way that I've defined Rademacher spaces is I take the L2 average, but by the kahan kinchin theorem, it doesn't matter if you take two, you can take P here. You can take P equals one in particular. So this Rademacher average, where you apply the operators from the set to each of the vectors, has to be controlled by the Rademacher average without the operators. This is our boundedness. Uh, the best C is denoted by R of T. Right. This is a really important definition. Um, other than the definition of the UMD property, this is possibly the most important definition for vector valued analysis that there is. That sounds like an overstatement, but it's not. This is this is a very important definition. Let me stress that. I'm even going to write very important. I think I've got like five exercises on this as well. That's how important it is. So, sorry, what does R stand for? That's an extremely good question. Um, there are three candidates for what R stands for. If you look at the history of this concept, Everybody is coincidentally, I think it was introduced in three places separately. All of them called it R boundedness because they were all familiar with each other. Uh, one source stands for apparently Reese boundedness because it has to do with some Reese stuff. Uh, some say Rademacher bounded because it's boundedness through Rademacher averages. Some say randomized bounded because it's boundedness through randomized sums. I think Rademacher bounded is probably the best interpretation of the R because it corresponds to having some boundedness on Rademacher spaces of operators from the set. So I will say it stands for Rademacher, but I have no authority here. <laughs> it's just R. Okay, thanks. <laughs> this really is a very important definition. So I want to pause on it and just think about what this means, right? I'll emphasize as well, this is a property that a set of operators has, not an individual operator. You don't say an operator is R bounded. You say this set of operators is R bounded. You can talk about an operator being bounded. It doesn't, well, I mean, you can say the set consisting of one operator is R bounded. This is actually always true. <laughs> so it doesn't say anything. 
let's start proving some properties. Actually, no, before I even prove any properties of R bounds, let's, this is the reason we talk about R boundedness. There's a theorem I'm not going to prove. Theorem by Thimble and Pus. Justifying why we talk about R bounds at all. If X and Y are is complex. It, is it a set of operators or is it a sequence of operators? You could have a sequence of operators that are all the same, right? And then that's, is that trivial? That's just, that's turns out to be equivalent. Um, it doesn't matter whether you consider an operator more than once. This is a okay. lemma that I probably should have included that I forgot. Yeah. It's, it's a property of a set. Okay. And when I take all finite sequences in the set, that allows for repetitions. There's a, you can define the property where you don't allow for repetitions and they're the same property. Okay. With the same constant. Yeah. You've made it more complicated than it should have been. <laughs> I was going to say that later. <laughs> okay. clement Proust theorem, which we're not going to prove. Consider complex Banach spaces and consider P between one and infinity and a symbol of a Fourier multiplier. And suppose that the Fourier multiplier with symbol M is bounded from LPX to LPY. So this is a, a converse to a Fourier multiplier theorem. Suppose that a Fourier multiplier with operator valued symbol is bounded on LP. Then the set of operators M of Xi where Xi not all Xi, but where Xi is a Lebesgue point of M. I'll remind you what that means in a second. This set is R bounded. Uh, and if M is continuous, then every Xi is a Lebesgue point of M. So this says that the range of M is R bounded. Now the Lebesgue points, this is the Xi zero such that M of Xi zero is equal to the limit as R goes to zero of the average from Xi zero minus R to Xi zero plus R for M Xi, the Xi. If you know the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, it's a set of points for which the Lebesgue differentiation theorem holds where the values of M can be recovered as local averages about that point. This set's got full measure, the complement has measure zero. So this says that up to measure zero, the range of a Fourier multiplier symbol is R bounded if the Fourier multiplier is bounded. In particular, if every point's a Lebesgue point, the range of the Fourier multiplier is R bounded. So R boundedness is, is a necessary condition for boundedness of Fourier multipliers. R boundedness is necessary for LP bounded. Fourier multiplies. The proof's not hard. I just don't want to go through the proof. Um, it's in the analysis in Barnack Spaces book. Of course, there's a reference to it in the notes. So this says that if you want to prove Fourier multiplier theorems with operator valued symbols, you will necessarily have to think about R boundedness. You're going to have to do R boundedness arguments. It's unavoidable. That's why we deal with it. In the scalar valued setting, it is a, an old, old theorem that if you have a Fourier multiplier, then the symbol has to be bounded, right? This is the operator theoretic version of that. Straight boundedness is not enough. It needs to be R bounded. We have a break soon. Let's just quickly say a couple of things about R boundedness, just simple consequences from the definition. If you've got a single operator T, and you look at the set containing just that operator, singletons of operators, the R band of that set is actually just the operator norm of that operator, simple. So on single operators, R boundedness is not an interesting concept, basically. It's just the operator bound. Uh, the reason this is true, if you wanna see the proof, take a Rutter marker average of a finite collection of vectors and apply a sequence contained in the set. Of course, all of these have to be T in this case because it's a one element set. 
take the Rademacher average in the definition and notice that you can take that T and you can take it outside of the sum because it's just one operator. Of course you can do that, right? And you can bound that by the operator number T, etc. And you can also get the, the converse direction by taking capital N to be zero so that the Rademacher sum, actually let me write that out. If you take just one vector and one writer market variable, quite stupidly, the expectation just drops out, right? And if you take the supremum over all single vectors x0, you recover, or the infimum, infimum supremum, yeah, you recover the operator norm of t. All right, that's nice and straightforward. So operator norms of, of single, well, R bounds of single operators are not interesting. That's easy enough. Uh, you can also show directly from the definition that if T prime is a subset of T and T is a subset of bounded operators from X to Y, then the R bound of T prime is less than or equal to the R bound of T because it's basically a supremum over the set of all finite sequences within the set. And if you have a smaller set, then you have a smaller supremum. I'm not gonna write down the proof of that. That was the proof in words. Um, so what this implies, if you look at all of the singleton subsets of the set T, it says that the R bound of T is greater than or equal to the supremum over all operators in the set of the operator norm. And this says that R boundedness implies uniform boundedness. So if you have a set of bounded linear operators, you can ask whether it's uniformly bounded, of course. And it turns out this is weaker than R boundedness. Because yeah, if, if R of T, if you are bounded, if, if R of T is finite, then so is the uniform bound, right? It turns out these properties aren't equivalent. You might ask, hang on, is R boundedness just uniform boundedness in disguise? And we'll do that after the break, show that at least for Hilbert spaces, they're equivalent, but for general Barnack spaces, they're not. You might expect that this R boundedness really says something that looks like orthogonality through Rademacher spaces. And if you're dealing with Hilbert spaces, all those Rademacher spaces are just L2. And then R boundedness is uniform boundedness. But we'll do that after the break because now it's time for a break.